Thank you, Beth. Thank you, Bruce. I'll always remember Beth from Spitfire Grill, which um, was one of my favorite movies, and then they brought that to the stage, and she did a wonderful job as Hannah. Thank you, Richmond, for reading this morning, and um, thank you again to all of you for the care that you have provided over the past four weeks, all of the cards and phone calls and texts and meals, um, just greatly appreciated during what was at least parts of it a pretty difficult time. I went to the doctor five weeks ago now tomorrow um, with something that I thought could be taken care of very quickly and um, they sent me to the hospital and I was there for a week before I before I came home. So um, your mind does and your heart do kind of funny things when you're in a, in a situation like that. So automatically my mind is going to um, my health, of course, and then the insurance deductible that would have to be paid. Um, the fact that I was being told that I wouldn't get back to work for several weeks. Um, all the loose ends I had left on the previous Friday that I was expecting to finish up on that Monday um, were now going to be in definite hold. So anxious about all of those things. And then um, had a little bit more opportunity to watch the news and read the news than I usually do. And um, my goodness, what a horrendous few weeks, especially here in, in our nation where we have legislators and executors of law and interpreters of law that I think most of us would probably be hard pressed to have on our condo boards. Um, unless we really needed it. And the, the rights that are being stripped away and the vitriol that is being spewed. So there's all those things. And then you're sitting there worried about all those things. And then other things leak in, don't they? Oh my goodness, we're getting ready to sell the campus. What are we going to do? My son's going away to college in a year. What are we going to do about that? And it just spins and spins and spins and spins. And so the way that I usually mitigate that anxiety that comes along is um, just start working and start getting something done. And so I was in a position where I wasn't even able to do that. So it was just kind of sitting there and stewing. So eventually I reached out to the people that I call to for, for assistance and for wisdom. And I had a conversation with someone and they were sharing with me something that I've shared, something that I've asked to folks for the past decades. But in the moment that I was in, wasn't thinking about it. And so their question to me was, Jason, where is God in all of this? Where is God in all of this? And that might sound trite, and might sound simplistic. And if our idea of God is somebody, a man with a white beard, far removed from our circumstances and where we are, then it is a little bit trite and simplistic. But if God is that ground of all being that Tillich talks about. If God is all-encompassing love and God is all-encompassing truth, then there might just be something to that. This week, Rosemary Radford Reuther died. She was a Roman Catholic, feminist, pro-choice, theologian. And I was remembering this week, I was actually introduced to her by a theology professor that I had that was Southern Baptist. So a holdover from the time when we used to listen and consider one another's ideas. God, she says, is not a being removed from creation 
ruling it from outside in the manner of a patriarch or ruler. God is the source of being that underlies creation and grounds its nature and future potential for continual transformative renewal in biophilic, I had to look that up, in biophilic, in life-loving mutuality. So yeah, where is God in our circumstances? And where is God leading us in our circumstances? They're important questions, but how do we find the answer to those? And I think we see at least hints of that in our scripture readings this morning, this passage from Revelation and this passage from Acts, the story of the, the beginnings of the church is described by Luke, the second of his two volumes. One volume, Luke, being the story of Jesus in this, this second volume about the early church. And I was reading from the beginning of that this week and reminded again, and we've talked about this before, that Luke or the author of Acts, wrote this to Theophilus, who could have either been a patron that was paying for Luke's worth, or it could have been a more general greeting, Theophilus, to the one that loves God. Here's what this looks like. And by this time in the book of Acts, we've, we've gotten to Paul, and Paul can be discussed and argued, and there's things that we like about Paul, and I'm sure there's things that some of us don't like about Paul. But Paul understood how to discern and how to hear the voice of God and feel the direction of the Spirit and to act accordingly. So how did he do that? Paul had visions all the time of what could be done and what should be done. Visions are things that, you know, good, calm, religious folks like us don't think about and don't talk about too much. But what is your vision? When we look at the way the country is, as we look at the way the planet is, do we accept that this is reality? Or do we look for a vision of how things could be different? A vision like the author of Revelation who was living in a horrible time under the Roman Empire, being persecuted for what he believed, and yet had this beautiful, glorious vision of what could be. Do we entertain that at all? Or do we look at the so-called reality and accept that is the way things always will be? Paul had visions Paul sensed the direction of God to go here and to go there. Sometimes he was right. Sometimes he wasn't right and had to turn around or go somewhere else. But he paid attention to those yearnings and those visions. How did he come to that place where he was able to have those? How can we as followers of Jesus in the 21st century be privy to those visions. And I think we see that in the pattern of Paul's life. Paul was a mystic. He had direct experiences with God as he understood specifically as an experience with the risen Christ. We see that on the road to Damascus where the blinding light comes down and the voice of God, God's self, speaks to Paul. There's other places where we're told that, that he was caught up into another heaven. Mysticism 
is experience of the divine, experience of the spirit, not mediated by an institution or a document, but experienced firsthand. And Paul put himself in the place where he was able to experience that. In this passage from Acts that Richmond read for us this morning, when Paul got to Philippi, we're told that he went outside of the city gates to pray, to spend time with God in spirit. And that's where he found Lydia and these others that were meeting her there. Do we put ourselves in the place where we're able to catch that vision, to discern that spirit when it comes? John Stuart Mill was, has been called one of the greatest English-speaking philosophers of the 19th century. He was a philosopher, he was a parliamentarian, he was an economist, just a brilliant mind. A brilliant mind that was recognized early in his life by his parents. And so his father wanted to make sure that he provided for John Stuart Mill's education. And so he taught him philosophy and science and economics and mathematics but didn't want him to have anything to do with religion. So his, his father said, that's going to be too much of a distraction. We're going to keep him from that. And John Stuart Mill did grow up to be brilliant and to serve the world well. But looking back on his childhood and that, that lack of exposure to things of the spirit, he said, my head was full but my soul was empty. He said, I had a well-prepared boat and a well-stocked boat, but no sail. There was always that sense of longing. Our faith, not just the list of things that we believe, but our faith how we engage the divine is the sail that catches the wind of the Spirit that points us in the direction that we need to go. Paul, through his practice of the things that he did know, took him into the unknown into a future that sometimes he could imagine and sometimes he couldn't even imagine. I wonder if the same could be true for us. We often think about these things separately, of the things that need to get done and then our faith. What if those two were to come together? What if, by the practice of our faith, by spending time in prayer and meditation and walking and listening to one another, we were able to catch a vision for a preferable future? That's how Paul was able to discern the movement of the Spirit. But it wasn't the only way that Paul was able to discern the movement of the Spirit. Sometimes we think our faith is just about the list of things that we believe. Sometimes we think our faith is, is just about our practice and sitting on our meditation mat. But in the story of Paul, in the whole story of Acts, there's something else that's a part of that as well. And I love these couple of chapters, Paul, Acts 15 and, and 16, because amidst the great journeys, amidst the great miracles of the early church, there's this stream of stories about relationships. 
And so back in Acts 15, Paul and his mission partner Barnabas were getting ready to go on another journey, another mission trip to to share and to proclaim the gospel. And so Barnabas wanted to take another disciple with them. John Mark said he wants to go with us as well. I think he'll be a great addition to the team. Paul said, you know what? No. No. We're not going to take him. See, John Mark had been on a previous trip, and he had quit halfway through. Got to be too much for him. He got discouraged, and he left. And so Paul said, no, we're not taking John Mark. He's a, he's a quitter. We need folks that we can count on. But Barnabas, his partner, said, you know, I see something in him. He deserves a second chance. And so Barnabas went on a journey with John Mark, and Paul went in a different direction, and he took another partner, Silas. So which one of them was correct? I don't know. Probably both of them. And so here's the gospel going to two places instead of just one. So Paul and Silas embark, they move out, they go somewhere where they meet another young minister named Timothy, and he comes along with him. There's roadblocks in the way, they can't get to where they originally wanted to go. So Paul had stopped, and he was discerning, and he was praying, and he had a vision of a man from Macedonia that was asking for help. And so Paul said, receiving this vision, so let's let's go. And so they go to Macedonia. They go to the city of Philippi and spend some time there. And then Paul and the others go outside of the city, outside of the establishment, outside of the common wisdom, down by the river to pray, this this place that's sacred, this place that's special, This place that's outside of the confines of what we know. Rivers throughout culture and history and movements are always sacred places. And there he meets someone. Was this the man that he saw in his vision? No, it happened to be a woman. Just another wonderful way that the author of Luke in Acts lifts up women in a culture that that was not very amenable to their presence in their work, in their ministry. So here was Lydia, who was making her own way. She was Greek. She was a Gentile. And she had her own business. And... She was a seeker after God. So all three of those things in Roman culture at the time would have probably put her at the margins. And yet here she is, successful, seeking the divine, seeking the movement of the Spirit. And for whatever we think about Paul, He chooses to engage her. He didn't say, well, no, my vision was of a man. I need to find a man. He didn't say, no, you can't be the person that I'm supposed to meet. You're you're a woman. They engaged with one another. And Paul proclaimed the gospel, the good news which he understood in the person of Christ. And Lydia recognized that this was a manifestation of what she was looking for, what she was yearning for, what she was desiring. So what did she do? She asked Paul to come home with her and to be a guest in her house. See, it's not just in the grand visions that we sense the movement of God. 
It's not even just in our spiritual practice that opens us up to the movement of God. It's our interactions with those with whom we come in contact. John Pavlovitz, who's a pastor and an author, wrote this. When you meet another person, you are coming face to face with a once in history, never to be repeated, reflection of the image of God. If God is God, there's no other option. (laughs) They are each made of God stuff. Every single day you encounter thousands of breathing, animated thumbnails of the divine. Ram Dass, as usual, put that in a little bit more pithy way. Treat everyone you meet as if they are God in drag. I love that. And so the two components of that are on the part of Paul and the part of Lydia, a willingness to be open to one another in that initial encounter. Either of them could have said, no thanks. Paul toward Lydia because of her place in society. Lydia toward Paul because I have to think that Paul's personality was a little rough around the edges. But in that moment, they were open to each other. And then on the part of Lydia, that offering of hospitality, that welcoming in, which is always the gospel lived. It's always countercultural. In a society that's built on scarcity and fear and not enoughness. I have to make sure that I get mine and then maybe we'll think about if you get yours. And sometimes what's mine just keeps increasing and increasing and increasing because I'm so scared and so fearful that I run out that I can't participate in the abundance of the world. And then people on the margins and the planet itself suffers from that. Hospitality says there's enough and I'm going to share it with you. You see, that's the gospel. That's the good news. That's the resurrection. That is the abundance of God made real. That's a denial of the story of scarcity and fear and hatred and anger. That's how we discern the movement of God. By practicing, just like how we get to Carnegie Carnegie Hall. We practice, practice, practice. Both our chosen spiritual practices of meditation, time in scripture, prayer, and practicing that hospitality, that compassion with one another. And I know that gets harder and harder to do these days. What if we could be different? Listening to the stories of one another. Finding the God in drag in one another. Is we continue to hold firm to our values. Of which one is that love 
and compassion of God. Will you join me in prayer?